Okay, thanks. Okay, I hit record and I'm with uh, author Jenny Wilson. Jenny, talk to us about where you are in your writing journey right now. Yeah, hi. Um, I am working on my first novel and I finished my first draft and now I'm working on revisions. So I'm uh, a couple revisions in right now and um, just looking for some help with my characters. Um, the The book that I'm working on is a Greek myth retelling. So it goes back to my college days where I um, studied ancient civilizations in Greek and Latin. So I'm kind of finally using my degree. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I love when we can like take our past lives and plug them into the work we're doing. That's always super fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So we did a, this is catching me up. We did a session where we talked about your lead character's growth. Say her name for me. Well, there's a lot of ways to say her name. I say Iphigenia. Iphigenia. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I I might just start calling her Iffy because I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna mess that up. Um, so <laughs> Iphigenia. If I start messing it up, we're shifting. <laughs> uh, Iphigenia. We've got a long um, age plot with her. Three parts of the story. She starts at 14. Um, quickly uh is um kind of taken from her home moved into is she enslaved no she's not enslaved um she's been so she was supposed to be sacrificed by her father that's right yeah but and then she's she sent gets, away yeah. yeah she gets rescued and sent away yeah she has some like um she has 18 we have between 14 and 18 we have scenes of her like experiencing anxiety and like struggling with the moment by the time she's 24 we have her being like hardened and bitter um but she's like taking charge of her future she has a season of like hopelessness where she's having uh suicidal ideations and then at 28 those scenes around 28 she's she rallies um and then we move into a like uh victory moment. Um am I getting that right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So we've got kind of a, a really beautiful over a three part story, a really beautiful vo voice arc, really nice. Like we talked about how the voice is gonna modulate. Um yeah, super exciting. Okay, what can I help you with today? What do you want to work on today? Um, what I wanted to work on today is I'm worried that I might have too many characters. So I'm or I'm trying to balance. So I'm telling, I'm retelling a myth. Yeah. So I need, there's a certain, you know, number of characters that I need to yeah. have because yeah. they're part of the traditional story. Yep. People um, but, expect them. Yeah. People expect it. And then um, I've also added, you know, my own characters and nice. um, to serve, you know, different purposes throughout the story. So I'm just a little worried um, that there's too many maybe. And then also I want to, I mean, the characters that I named, I tried to give them pretty simple names, but they're still foreign. So I'm worried that if I have too many characters with Greek names, it might be kind of hard for readers to keep track of. Yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, I'm going to pull your character list up real quick so we can look at it together. Okay. Uh, boop, boop, boop. Thanks for sending me this, by the way. I love oh, yeah. I love spreadsheets. Spreadsheets <laughs> are my favorite. Um, so this is your uh, protagonist. By the way, thank you for having a single protagonist story. So many <laughs> lately I've, I've been, I love multiple vehicle stories, but they just get really complicated. Um, so this is nice. <laughs> So you've got your um, lead vehicle uh, in Effie, and then um, these don't repeat over the chart, do they? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, yeah. fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. That is yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, um, how many words are you thinking part one is? About twenty-five thousand. Okay. And part two and three are going to come out at like 50, you think, or longer? Um, I'm at about 80 right now total, so a little bit longer. Okay. Have you ever, have you heard me talk about engines and anchors before? I have a little, yes, I have a few times. Okay. So mm -hmm. 
when it comes to like how important are these characters to your story how many times do they show up right now you have their purpose in the plot which is great and something you need to know but it's a story related like a plot related event related relationship to the protagonist so the idea behind this kind of thinking is that the protagonist is the hero of the events of the story and this is how these people interact with the events of the story what we need to to decide how important they are and whether or not we need to cut some to see the overlap we need to decide how they impact the character's growth arc okay so we know that um if he's going from a like a place of stability to a negative place and then back into a mature place of stability. So these characters are going to take three different roles. Engines are going to empower her growth. Okay. Now a character could be, so like you have here, like, you know, Agamemnon has this ultimate betrayal, um, which sets off the protagonist's distrust of people. So you've got some qualitative words there, sets off the distrust of people. Um, that wouldn't make him an anchor because he is um, encouraging his actions and what he does encourages the worst version of herself. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you said it does make him an anchor? Yeah, it would make him an anchor. So anchors pull the character down to the worst version of themselves, encourage the character down to the worst version of themselves. Engines encourage the character to be the best version of themselves. Um, Do you have like a favorite uh, popular series or something you've connected to that we can use like as a language like uh, Hunger Games or Harry Potter or... Tolkien or Game of Thrones. Jones? Game of Thrones, great. So um I know it less well than the other ones because it's been a long time since I read it, but we can make it happen. So um Jon Snow at the wall has the kind of um like uh chubby academic guy. And Sam. Sam, thank you. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say Sam wise, but I was like, no, that's the hobby. <laughs> um, that's I mean that's Lord of the Rings. So um, he's got Sam. Sam um, is vulnerable and weak, and when he first gets to the wall and doesn't look like he's going to survive, Jon Snow wants to stay to himself and be left alone. Like, that's the worst version of Jon Snow. But being around Sam brings out Jon Snow, the leader and hero. Okay. So we see Jon Snow start to defend this vulnerable guy, and so Sam is Jon Snow's engine. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So on the other hand, there's a bunch of, at some point, a bunch of Lannisters show up to the wall and they are kind of entitled and awful and hate Jon Snow. And they remind Jon Snow that he's a bastard. And so not in a like cussing way, but in a like actual, he he's you know fatherless. Uh. So they, um, they, make him vengeful and wrathful and make him want to lash out. So they're taking him to the worst version of himself. So they're an anchor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Now here's the trick as we start going through this cast, the, the more anchors you have, the harder the struggle for your protagonist, for your vehicle, because they have a lot of people to fight off. They got a lot of people who are like encouraging them to be negative. The more engines you have, the easier the storyline is and the simpler the storyline is. So typically in a YA, you're in a lot of engines because the storyline is you know easier. In like a darker fantasy, you're going to have a lot of anchors because the plot's going to feel heavier. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the cast we're building, the reason I'm going through this is the cast we're building around Iffy. Um, we want to make sure that it's setting the right tone. For what you want okay um any questions about that um no no okay so let's go through real quick before we decide like 
before we go through like how much these people are in the plot and before we go through like you know what is their actual impact let's go through and just list them as anchors or engines because if you have like 15 engines we're going to cross some of these people out does that make sense yeah um and if you have all anchors, I'm going to tell you like, okay, she's got to have an engine somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. There's a third kind of character, which is a hazard character. Okay. Hazard characters don't actually impact Iffy's growth. They show up and they force Iffy to make choices, but they don't impact the direction of those choices. So talking Game of Thrones... Jon Snow, the White Walkers are hazards for him. They okay. don't encourage the best side of him. They don't encourage the worst side of him. They just give him somebody to deal with, right? Like, so they show up. He's like, oh, crap, I got to deal with this stuff, right? Okay. His okay. wolf is a, wait, does John have a wolf? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. His, his wolf is his engine, right? Like, his wolf comes around, and he's the best version okay. of himself. Um, the wolf is actually symbolic of the best version of himself, which I think is fun about Game of Thrones and the Starks. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's neither here nor there. Um, so if they're neither, if they're just somebody that's going to force her, if they're just around and their choices force her to make choices, but they're not influencing her in a negative or pos positive way, let's call them a hazard. Okay. 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 All right. Mom, engine anchor or hazard? <laughs> Okay, so it's complicated. <laughs> the, we'll start with the complicated one. Um, yeah. She's actually an engine, but um, Iphigenia, at for in the first part or the in part two, considers her an anchor or like considers her a um, enemy. Yeah, but so, she's really not. And this is one of the reasons we change this. We go with this language because enemy and ally are plot language okay that has to do with the like of iphigenia's goals right like so i want then the reason we move this language around is because a lot of times in a good story the vehicle's goals are going to change right so iphigenia that, that's why like ally and um ally and enemy become less helpful words because the vehicles like Ephigenia's goals throughout the story are going to shift. So somebody might be an enemy at the beginning. And then by the end, Ephigenia realizes that they're actually an ally. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. Okay. But that's why we're getting, we're going to move, but as we design your cast, we're going to move away from those plot words and we're going to get to okay. like engine. So the okay. mother brings out the best in Ephigenia even mm -hmm. though the things she's doing, Ephigenia hates. Yeah, I would yeah. say. Yeah, so yeah. she'd be an engine then. Yeah, it's like, okay. um, you know, in Batman comics, uh, the um, the uh, villains are all of his engines. They bring out the absolute best in him, right? Like when he's around the Joker, uh -huh. he's the best version of himself. Okay, okay. So, yeah, right. that's that's kind of what you're what what I hear you saying there is like she's making decisions that Ephigenia sees as like ruining her life, but which is common for a teenage plot, but they're not ruining her. They may or may not be. Either way, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And let me say because your plot is complicated. We just to be clear as we go through this. Sorry, I keep giving you caveats. If we've got if oh, I'm gonna butcher this. Evagenea. <laughs> don't look too close. It's spelled fine. <laughs> if we've got Evagenea neutral, right? We yeah. know that she's gonna go for the first part of the plot. She's gonna go like anxiety, depression. Um, uh, ideations. Okay. Not, not indentations, ideations, <laughs> right? That's when I say pushes her to the negative version of herself. That's okay. what we're talking about. Okay. And I would also add in there, just knowing your growth are from what we talked about before, um, hardened to relationships. Yes. Right. Right. Um, and then the best part of your plot, the best version of her 
is this um uh leader um mm -hmm. self-reliant um inner strength yes right so people that encourage is that a good way to explain her best version perfect yep okay exactly. i just want to make sure we're on the same page yeah pay no attention to how I so engines push her this way encourage her this way anchors encourage her that way okay hazards are like you know what are you gonna do now that's the hazard okay yeah. all right so i just wanted to before we go through and i'd like totally destroy your plot i just wanted to make sure <laughs> i'm not gonna do that okay electra okay um engine nice yeah uh ortisis orestes 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 yep yeah. he is a he's in the first part i would call him a hazard okay and in part the last part because he shows up again he would be an engine okay why is he an engine down here um because by this point she is Feel she's in power of her own life. Um, okay. this very, very, very end of the story. He shows up like in the last couple of chapters, okay. and so um, at this point, she is um, kind of show. She's controlling her own life, and it's shown through the way that she handles him. Her reunion with him, because okay. it's been fifteen years. He's he's a man now instead of a child and yeah so okay. the way that she kind of interacts with him is showing her um ultimate growth okay so let's keep him a hazard okay she's already grown by the time she gets to him. Uh, good point okay that makes sense so he's giving mm -hmm. her an opportunity to express herself okay. but he's not actually encouraging growth and the sure. the only reason that's important i'm not just being a jerk with terms the only okay. reason that's important is in a second in a minute we're going to do character voices okay and Engine anchor and hazard actually will help you build these characters' voices. Okay. So we'll get there. Okay. Um, okay. Um, is is Mini? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> she is an engine. Okay. I have lots of engines here. Um, Demolis and Demolis is an engine. Okay. Ampelos is a hazard. Odysseus. What about Herminia? Oh, I skipped. Um, yeah, she's a hazard. Okay. Ampelos. Yeah, she's a hazard. Okay. Um, Odysseus. Odysseus. I know that one. Yeah, he is an anchor. Okay. Nice. I like taking uh, heroes from, and kind of flipping <laughs> them on their head. Uh, yeah. Achilles. Oh boy, I don't know. Um, he's definitely not an engine. Um, does he um put her down, talk down to her? Um, she never meets him. She never meets him, but okay. she's supposed to marry him. Exactly. And then in the end, he helps rescue her. But at this point, she's unconscious, so she never meets him. <laughs> yeah, when we talk about what what we're looking for in like an engine and anchor, somebody that she's actually going to have some form of a relationship with okay no. so we'll make him a hazard he's he's a big part of the plot but he's not yeah. a big part of her um mm -hmm. circle of people does that make sense yeah 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 okay. your engines and anchors are gonna be like if this is made into a movie they get the top rungs on your imdb page Right, okay. like when you look at like all the actors who are in the movies, it's like, here's the protagonist, here's the vehicle, and then here are all their engines and anchors, and then here are the hazards that show up. Right, like so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brad Pitt may play Achilles again in your in your show, but he's going to be at the very bottom of the. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Big G. I'm not going to try to uh, say that name. Glaucos. He is an a hazard. Okay. And um, um, I think Canlis is a hazard too. Okay. I want to give, I want to make him an engine, but he's probably not. <laughs> okay. Does he spend um, more than two scenes with her? No. Then he's a hazard. Okay. Yeah. Any of these? So I'm going to color code these real quick just so we can okay. see them easily. No, that's not what I want. Mm -hmm. um, 
Boop. Boop. So just a couple observations I'm going to mm -hmm. make while we color code. Okay. Um, all of your engines are female. Okay. That's not bad, okay. but it is going to create a theme of um, men trouble women supportive. Again, not bad at all. Great theme, but just uh -huh. so you see it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because this is about, the reason we do this is to help you make strategic choices about what you want in your blood so we've got you know sister and mother as an engine we've got former nurse as an engine and we've got hand um handmade as an engine so you've got you know four very strong female characters that are all coming around her does that make sense well yeah. the mother's not coming around her the mother's causing problems that lead her to become the best version of herself but just something to think about the reader feels good in the end of the, by the end of the story, the reader is going to feel good about all the engines, even if they're villains, because they, the reader will feel not actually know, but feel them empowering her. And that's going to give them a good feeling about those characters. The reader will hate hazards. So I hate, and hate anchors. The reader will love hazards. Um, okay. Okay, sir, so how many, on a scale of one to three, one being they're in just a couple scenes, two mm -hmm. being uh, they're in a decent amount of scenes, and three being like they're in a lot of scenes. Okay. Rank these for me. Father? One. Mother? Three. Uh, sister? Three. Uh, brother? One. Uh, nurse. Three. Uh, um, brothers, brothers, nurse. One. Handmade. Two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. But mother's handmade. One. Um. Odysseus. Um. Two. Uh, two. Yeah. Uh, it, this isn't an exact science. Achilles. Yeah. We already one. said one for Achilles. One um, for the other three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is great. That's what you want for your hazards. You want your hazards to be in one. So let's okay. go ahead and manage hazards real quick with it when it comes okay. to voice. Um, okay. So we're going to type. Oh, I didn't mean to make that so big. We're going to go um, scene number. And then this last part here is. Um, uh voice you want hazards to be one note and you want them to be big you remember when i talked to you about if he's voice i was like take three adjectives to describe mm -hmm. her and then let's build a voice out of that yeah hazards you want to take one adjective okay and you want to make them loud because them having a big voice is what forces your character to navigate around them so um going back to um game of thrones uh the uh daenerys targaryen's um love interest now he's really an engine never mind um Sorry, I'm trying. I'm running through in my head the characters. There's so many stinking characters in that. I know. <laughs> and the reason is, is there's so many. There's like seven or eight vehicles just in the first book. So you have like a really complex. Um, okay, here's one. Bald okay. monk. I can't remember his name. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 I, I know who I can't remember either. He's a hazard. Right. Like he doesn't show up in a lot of scenes in the first book. He's kind of around in the background. He's and people have to respond to him. He's doing things that make people respond all the time. Big voice. Right. Like he's kind of I would say like the one adjective I'd describe him as is manipulative. He's always <laughs> manipulated. Right. Like when he comes okay. on a scene, you're like, he's going to manipulate. So his voice is based off of like, this is the guy that manipulates. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Later in book two, um, 
one of the sisters goes to the mountains and meets a bunch of like mountain people. They're hazards and they're like brutish and um they're kind of like their their version of like, you know, barbarians. And so you get this like brutish angry type, you know, I've got an axe and I'm going to swing it character. They're hazards cuz they're they're one note, right? Like they have an axe, they're mad. They speak mm-hmm. in like really short sentences. They're yelling all the time, right? Like yeah. so with these hazards, think about their like one personality trait that's going to define them. And part of the reason we want to do this is because we want to make sure a that their voice is different than iffy's okay if you don't make their voice big they're going to just blend in with the cast so we want their voice to be big we want them to be uh, and we don't want them complicated right they're not the focus we don't want people figuring out who they are so not complicated okay Um, yeah so the next let's talk about anchors your anchor voice you want your anchor voice to you want your voices to complement and contrast effies okay right so if we think about effie's voice when she's this leader reliant in her strength you want engines to also show some of those qualities they don't they shouldn't show all of them but they might show like one or two and then vary the next one does that make sense with Uh anchors you don't want them to resemble all of the bad qualities but you want them to resemble one or two that so like i would say let's take her father describe her father's personality to me um he is um well he's a king so he's very like um bold and take charge sort of you know yeah <laughs> bold, bold and take, take charge. charge yeah would you say he's hardened to relationships he's isolated um, sort of i mean he does have a soft spot for his kids but other than huh. that yes yeah he is so that's that's something you want to bring out in his voice Right. He's bold. And like, so if you're going to use the three adjectives for him to like help you craft that character, like, you know, bold, commanding, Mm -hmm. and um, hard. Yeah. That's probably what I'd say. So, and the reason we do that is because when he shows that hardness, he's going to, uh, uh, he's showing us who he's driving Effie to be. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So her, but we don't want, we just want to carry over like one or two of those adjectives, compliment and contrast. We want him to be different, right? So when we're talking about the father, we want a voice that's bold, commanding. That's very different than Effie's voice. Mm -hmm. Hard. That represents who she's going to become. I really think the best example of this, the clearest example of this, is in uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, where you have Sam, who represents the best version of Frodo, and Gollum, who represents the worst version of Frodo. And so okay. Gollum is selfish and um, conniving and obsessive, right? Yes. Sam mm-hmm. is sacrificial and serving and um, uh and uh, honorable yeah right? so you've got these two opposite frodo is stuck in the middle we want him to become like sam mm-hmm. he keeps drifting into Gollum, right? right and that's how effie is gonna feel we want her to become like her engines but she's gonna keep drifting into her anchors and that's her struggle does that make sense? Like that's what defines the the character growth struggle for her. Um, is this helpful? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Are yeah. you feeling? Do we need to slow down? Are you feeling overwhelmed? No, not at all. This perfect. Not at all. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Talk to me about. Um, let's do the threes. Talk to me about uh, mom. Okay. Yeah. So mom is. I think she would represent the leadership role. That. Okay. 
if Janaya comes into being later, um, she's, you know, however, at this point, she's pretty, um, she keeps her kids pretty distant from her. Okay. In order to protect them. Okay. Um, I like that distant leader. It pairs well with the father, but it's different because he's got that boldness to her, to him. And she, you didn't mention boldness with her, but they both no. have that like commanding and distant mm -hmm. thing. His is being, we're talking about his being expressed, expressed as hard and commanding and hers being expressed as leader and distant. If you can like in your head, as you start to envision these characters voices, if you can know that like, okay, I know these two complement each other when they're together that like, commanding and distant presence of the two of them together is going to feel overwhelming to Effie. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So like just knowing how, like, and that's why we do this is like, how do these, because the reader's going to see the whole story through Effie's eyes. So right. how does Effie feel about these people that, or how does she perceive them? These two are similar. So she's going to like, they're going to exaggerate each other's qualities. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Talk to me about um, sister. Okay, well, she's little at this okay. point. Um, so she is, so she she brings out, what she brings out is um, Iphigenia's like nurturing side. Okay, so she's and, vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, she's definitely vulnerable. There you go, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, she's vulnerable. And she's also very curious, which um, helps. So Iphigenia is also curious, but like together they're just yeah constantly needing to know stuff. So yeah, and we've talked that we talked about when we we're doing her growth that she loses that as she she, does. she goes dark. So yeah. that's a nice contrast. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's great. I, and you don't need three. You can just run with two. If there's a third one that pops, that's awesome. But okay. again, these are supporting cast members. So yeah. they don't have to be as complicated as Effie. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Talk to me about a uh, former nurse. Okay. So she she fulfills the, the nurturing role that her own mother doesn't really give gotcha. her. Um, so she definitely is, is nurturing. Um, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's basically her main her main role. Is. Okay, so nurturing, caring, yeah, compassionate. So she's uh she's one of those engines that isn't doesn't represent F Effie, but instead gives Effie kind of a positive view of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is another way to use an engine. You, they don't have to like. It complements Effie. It doesn't exactly match her, which is fine. It's great. Um, okay. It that totally works too. Um, okay, give me the handmaid. Okay, so the the handmaid is um, helping us to see Iphigenia's struggle. It's more of like a coming of age thing. So her struggle. Um, of switching, you know, of turning into a woman and being trained to become a queen someday. Like, you know, she's been a princess for this whole time and, and she's going to have to be, a, be able to lead. Yeah. And so, so the way that I use Damalis right now is she's kind of, um, she's showing us that, that straddling of those two um, roles. How does she sound? She's very timid. Well, she's a maid, so she doesn't really get to say too much. Sure. Um, she's more um, like we'll all see Iphigenia kind of boss her around, but feel uncomfortable about it. So that... she's an anchor. Oh, is she? Oh, no. She's an anchor. <laughs> no, it's good. You need more. Oh, okay. She's oh, bringing up. She... Okay. If, if Iphigenia is bossing her around uh -huh. and then feeling bad about it, that's a key sign that that's, the, that's somebody encouraging Ephigenia to be the worst version of themselves. Now, not actively encouraging. It's not like the handmaid's running around being like, boss me around. Yeah, but yeah. the presence of the handmaid encourages Ephigenia to be a bad version of herself. Okay. 
that's and that would great. that would make her an anchor and that's good because yeah. you have too many engines so that's a great okay. yeah um okay. does am I, does that make sense it does i had never hadn't thought of it that way but it does yeah yes. so lean into her being timid and i would make her anxious oh perfect yeah because you're gonna make yeah. Ephigenia anxious and the worst version of herself so make this girl anxious make Ephigenia uh respond very poorly to this girl's anxiety and this girl's timidity and um, then in part two when we see Ephigenia being anxious and timid we'll connect the two does that make okay. sense yes yeah mm -hmm. perfect um, yeah. okay Odysseus talk to me about Odysseus okay well he is the guy who who comes and and brings her to her her demise but um so I'm trying to think of like which part of her that he would represent start with how he sounds how does he um, sound so okay so he's a mr know-it-all he's a wise guy he, he's very manipulative and deceptive um so yeah he's he's pretty slimy <laughs> nice okay and she's when she's with him she's going to submit to kind of his power for lack okay. of better those aren't great words but yeah is that is that true like when he's around she becomes anxious yes for sure yeah, yeah. he's a great yeah. anchor so he's like um the handmaid he doesn't necessarily he's not her golem he doesn't like make he's she's never going to become slimy and manipulative right. but when he's around she becomes anxious and timid so that's right. that's what you like does that am i making sense yeah yeah, yeah. okay mm -hmm. so this is a better balanced cast we've got three anchors here there's going to be opportunities for her to be um start to veer into the worst version of herself and okay. then you've got some good, you've got three good engines. Now I will say the engines are showing up a lot more than the anchors. So, and I don't, knowing your story, I don't think this is bad. This is, or a problem at all. This is going to give your story, the first part of this story, a pretty uplifting feel until it's not. Okay. That's good. Does that that's make sense? Yeah. yeah. So that's mm -hmm. going to work. These engines are going to drive that. Okay. They're going to, she's going to, we're going to see her in a place of like comfort and success yeah. until she's not mm -hmm. in part two. Yeah. Okay. So let's yeah. talk part two. Okay. You still feeling good? Yeah. This is great. Yeah. Okay. I just need to make sure. I know yeah. sometimes I can like overwhelm people. So I just want to oh, make no. sure you're still here. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So tell me about uh, Maya. Yeah. yeah Maya. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Maya, I think she's kind of, can you be bold? Can a character be bold? Yeah, you end up being a hazard. <laughs> okay. Um, well, she plays a really big role. Okay. So, so talk she, to me about how she's both. Yeah. So she, um, she really makes Iphigenia feel extremely uncomfortable and brings out that anxiety, um, at first, but then towards the end of the story, as Iphigenia grows and matures, she kind of realizes um, where Maya is coming. Maya has a pretty big backstory. So she kind of realizes that. So Maya comes across as like crusty and grouchy, and, you know. Is but, Maya someone she has to overcome, or is Maya somebody that she um, has to learn to accept? has to learn to accept. Okay. She's an engine. Okay. Um, and so in order to connect, what I'm hearing you say is that in order to connect with Maya, uh, Effie has to grow into the best version of herself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yep. an and unfortunately, a lot of that happens after Maya has died, but it still happens. So yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Talk to me about Melissa. And you're right. She's a complicated engine. Like um, the handmaid is a complicated anchor. Okay. And then it's not that clean, like, 
Yeah. It's like the dad, he's hard. Yeah. So Maya sees that and then Maya's going to become hard. It's not that clean. Or it's not mm -hmm. like the more complicated one is Odysseus. Like she's never becoming a manipulative know-it-all, but he pushes her to be the worst version of herself. Uh -huh. um, there's that like pushing and pulling. Like some anchors are going to pull her, but like the, you know, the father's going to pull her to be hard. He's hard. That's going to make her hard. The Odysseus is going to push her to be anxious he's uh -huh. not anxious but he's doing things that push her in that direction um maya is going to push her to be the best version of herself where okay. it's like That's fair. yeah is that making am i making sense yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. Where her, her sister pushes her to be the best version of herself she's uh -huh. never going to be vulnerable that's not who you, that's not the character you're writing. Right. But the mother pulls her to be the best version of herself and that the mother is a leader that in the end, Ephigenia is going to represent a little bit. So she's pulling. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Talk to me about Melissa. Okay. Melissa is an engine. Okay. For Why sure. Is that? Um, she is. So where if Ephigenia here in parts, two and part of part three is pretty down and pretty, you know, anxious and depressed and all that. Uh, Melissa is the exact opposite. She's bright and cheery and she kind of, yeah, she, she brings out the best eventually. And yeah. yeah. And that's great because this is that anchor that this is that engine that pulls, right? Like, because she's bright and cheery, she's pulling Ephigenia up to her yeah. to stay bad Ephigenia would have to reject her does that make sense so there's yeah that yeah 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 she's kind of the kind of person that you can't be angry around <laughs> yeah she forces happiness yeah um talk to me about uh the the Theano Theano yeah Theano and Aida and our mother and daughter these are two characters that I do kind of struggle with a little bit if they're both needed so their role in the story is to show, um, is because I'm writing historical fiction, so it's oh, yeah. to show readers, you know, what the roles of women would have been, what the expectations would have been for okay. women back then. Because Iphigenia, Maya, Clytemnestra, none of these other female characters follow those um, mm -hmm. traditional roles. Well, kind of, but not really. Um, so anyway, I wanted to put somebody in there who would kind of show that, you know, you're expected to get married and have kids and that's it. So how does Ephigenia feel about those roles? Yeah. So she, at first she, that's what she wanted for herself. That's what she was raised, you know, okay. she was expected that she would become a, a wife and a mother someday. But then once she's kind of torn out of that life and forced into this other life, um, okay. she kind of over time, is okay with she becomes okay with that but it is a struggle for her yeah so we're going to call them hazards because okay. what you're describing is the struggle she has with um these people based on their role in society and but it's not she's your the your like story isn't about Ephigenia. will she won't she be a wife and mother so that's just kind of a thing in the world that exists that is something she has to cope with does that make sense yeah yeah uh, that, yeah, yeah perfect um okay bff i'm really oh, you say anchor but aiden no that she's part of that team oh no i'm sorry uh melantho, and melantho. yeah yeah so they're twins um honestly, these two are twins nice yeah <laughs> I I honestly think they might be hazards. I kind of okay. came to this thinking they were anchors, but after talking through some of this stuff, I don't. They don't really force her to do. I mean, they force her to react, but not yeah. really. They just grow. make crap hard. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But the nice thing about making crap hard is that you can rise against it, or you can like cower to it. That's okay. the perfect definition of a hazard. Like you know, they're. They're in the so if you think the reason I use the word hazard is because she's driving the vehicle, Ephigenia is driving the vehicle you're in, and when these two come around, she's got to swerve. She's got to swerve uh -huh. one way or the other. Uh -huh. She can't just stay going the same course. She's mm -hmm. got to move. So that's that's 
those you're describing perfect hazards is like okay. they're villains in the story in that they yeah. like make the events of the plot hard but mm -hmm. they in her character growth and in her and in their voices um they're gonna be just cause her to move i hazards are the most fun to write by the way okay because a their voices are simple you mm -hmm. can make them big and b big voices are fun so like you'll get and they really do create that texture in your cast that if you can if you get big hazard voices like you've got a lot of big hazards no one's ever going to say all these characters sound the same okay right because you've got all right. these like you know you've got these big voice characters and by big i just mean they're single note voices yeah yeah okay yeah uncomplicated voices yeah uh all right talk to me about nick andros i think he is an engine and the reason i i think that um so he helps her so her her main goal is to try to get back home and yeah. so he helps her and she fails i mean it doesn't work but he tries to help her um but i think that he's part of her arc and the sense he's part of um he comes into her life when she's hard and anxious and all that and he's part of the reason that she kind of becomes less anxious and um more stable <laughs> nice yeah that's yeah. great so he's just like a friend basically yeah, it's great okay. encouraging friend it's a good that's yeah. a solid engine yeah okay um okay no. Do I, is this the same one up here yeah she comes in for one scene in part three um yeah. so she's a hat or no she's an anchor yeah <laughs> She's an anchor up there. Um, what is she down here, though? Yeah, so down here, she's... You're dealing with a different version of Iffy down here. Yeah, for sure. Um, she is delivering some really bad news. Okay. And from back home. And that is part of what sends Iphigenia into her darkest moment, her depression, her... Um, yeah, totally. Suicidal episode. Yeah, Okay. So she's totally. still an anchor. <laughs> yeah. And it's great. It's nice that she's still an anchor because she's an anchor up here. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Effie's behaving badly around her. She shows back up. We expect like, oh, crap, here she comes. And yeah. she's an anchor just kind of in a little different way, but still like, yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, Cadmos. Right. So Cadmos is, he's an anchor. Okay. In, this, in this version um yeah why he is he her, he so he makes her feel um kind of all of so at this point she's she's pretty feeling pretty okay with her new life you know this is late in the story yeah um but he kind of brings back all those old feelings of anxiety and okay um yeah, anxiety. Um, this Arrested. is the same brothers up here. Yeah, so he comes back now. He's he's an adult. Yeah, and we. But I think he's still. Yeah, I think he's still a hazard, and I think Pilates is too. Okay, great. Um, all right, let's do our number game. One okay. to three. Okay, one to three. Three. Are we on Maya? Yeah, three for Maya. Three for Melissa. Theano would be two. Okay. And yeah, two for Aiden. Two and two. Okay. Probably. Um, I don't have Nick Andros in there very much right now, but I think I need to add him. So let's put him down as a two. Okay. Demolis is one. Cadmos is one. And everybody else is one. Okay. So you do have a problem with this, with the second half of this cast. Okay. The problem is your engines and hazards are the main driving force of the of the story in the second half, which means your lead my my fear is that if he's gonna come off as whiny. Okay. She's got all these people encouraging her. She has all these people living their lives, and she is 
still going deeper and deeper into depression. So we're not talking real life, right? Like, yeah, that can happen in real life. And people who are struggling that way aren't depressed. I have to say that because people might listen to this and they need <laughs> yeah. to know, like, I don't, I'm not saying depressed people are whiny. Please don't hear that. I'm saying yeah. that we need triggers for her that make her feel hopeless. Okay. And we need characters that represent those triggers. So you are missing in here. You thought I was going to cut characters. You are <laughs> missing in here an anchor that's at least a two, if not a three. That, why is that a date? That's so weird. <laughs> um, two or a three that every time she starts to get hopeful, this character needs to smack her back down. Okay. Oh, I have that. I didn't add him to my list. Perfect. Who is it? I have him. <laughs> He's a king. Um, king Thoas, which is spelled T-H-O-A-S. Thank you. I never would have spelled that the right way. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, How much does he show up? He's borderline two and three. Um, when he shows up, it's big. Um, Perfect. Yeah. He, every time he shows up, something bad happens. Yeah, and that's what we need. We need, so these engines are going to encourage her to be the best version of herself. You've got Melissa pulling her up. You've got Maya pushing her up, right? Maya's like, yeah. whenever I, I'm around Maya, I'm encouraged to be the best version of myself, just like with, with my sister, because there's some like vulnerability here. There's some things that I have to deal with. Melissa's pulling her up because Melissa's bright and cheery and she's like, Hey, we can do this. Let's have hope. Things are going to be great. You be the leader you're meant to be. Yeah. We need this guy. Every time mm -hmm. Melissa's like, we have hope. This guy needs to come and step on their necks. Yeah. Right. Does. And like, <laughs> yeah. no hope. No, nobody yeah. has hope. Yeah. So that's, that's the character you need in here to make this a dark thing. You may want to give this character a lackey. Okay. That's also around because it allows you to have this because this is a big character that shows up in big moments. Mm -hmm. You kind of want a lackey that's just running around. Okay. That can be an anchor that doesn't have to be a big moment. Does that make sense? Okay. Like, so, so every time she sees this lackey around, she like starts to, her heart rate raises a little. Or yeah, something. her heart rate races. Yeah. She stops. She tells um, Melissa to calm down. She tells Melissa, like, hey, be quiet, be quiet. Like, no, no, like, we gotta, we gotta, you know, he's gonna see us, he's gonna do this, he's gonna report on us, he's gonna, you know, make our lives miserable, he's gonna, you know, make everything terrible for us. It's that, like, you know, character that um, uh, really challenges her. Um, he's the anchor that she has to overcome. She has yeah. to overcome her fear of him if she's going to be the best version of herself. If she doesn't fight against him, she's going to remain down. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And the only reason you need him is because your other anchor is a king, so when he shows up, it's a big deal. You need somebody who can just pop up, and it's not a big deal. Okay. And I would say because you want part two to be pretty dark, mm -hmm. um, every time things start to get happy this guy needs to show up every time things start to get like positive this guy needs to show up a lot of times the trope around this character is the character that like wants an inappropriate relationship with her okay that she is he could you know abuse her take her do whatever he wants to her and that's kind of a looming specter does that make sense? Like that's the that's the trope for this character. The slimy dude who's like lurking in the background is known to abuse other people and might abuse her at any second. So he causes her real fear. There needs to be like genuine fear of this guy. Okay. Okay. Um, it's kind of like in Robin Hood, you have uh Prince John, who's like the big bad, but then mm -hmm. you have the sheriff of Nottingham running around being gross. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. you know, and that's that's kind of you have your Prince John and King Theos, the big bad, who is like making everyone's life hell. You need the local bad that makes her specific day to day existence hell. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you need to give him some kind of power. He needs to have power over her because she needs genuine fear that things are never going to get better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Does that, can you start to see that character? Yeah. A little bit? I'm already, I've already got it. Perfect. It's rolling in my head. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you want him to sound a little like Odysseus. Yeah. I was just thinking that he's, yeah. he's one of Odysseus for part yeah. two. Three. Yeah. I'd, I'd pull out the know-it-all. Okay. I'd keep him manipulative and slimy. Yeah. And instead of the know it all, I might make him um offensive. Okay. Or I might okay. make him um aggressive. Okay. Um to give him distance from Odysseus, but still make him feel scary. So the manipulative and slimy is gonna keep him scary. And then you but you don't want him being a know it all. So go the opposite of know-it-all maybe he's a brute okay right like maybe he's a maybe he's a braggart or a blowhard or like you know there's a lot of options there that separate him from odysseus in that way yeah yeah okay um Perfect. yeah okay what else can i we've we've gone through a lot what else can i help you with what else do you want to do um, I mean, do you think this is too many characters? I don't. I think it feels like a lot on paper. Mm -hmm. But if we look at you, the number of characters that are just showing up occasionally, you've got um, you've got a lot of those. So if you if these were all threes, I'd be like, oh man, you've got a lot of characters here. But if if we you know pull these out you really have a cast of like a strong supporting cast of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven players. Okay. It's not okay. bad at all. Very manageable, okay. right? Like I would be keeping some kind of voice chart. Um, did I talk to you about a character wheel? No. Okay. So I don't think I have one I can pull up. That's any, any relevant. It's a, there's a lot of different ways to do a voice chart. Um, do you work best like visualizing what a character looks like, or do you work best with um, some kind of more physical device or how do you visualize your characters? How do you get into your character voices? Um, I, yeah, I envision what they look like. Okay. So what a character wheel is, is you want to get a picture for each character. Okay. Um, Mid journey is great for this, but you can also use like, you know, just pull actors that like you imagine these characters to be. Okay. And then around each care, either under each character or around each character, you want to put their adjectives. Okay. I don't need hazards on this. I just need characters that are going to come back a lot so that I like know I can remember what their voice sounds like. I okay. usually put my lead character in the middle. Okay. Right in the middle of my page. Sometimes I'll draw this. Sometimes I'll use like a word doc or whatever you're using Scrivener. So you could just use a blank page for this. You okay. want to put like your character's picture in the middle and then best version of herself, write the adjectives on the top, worst version of herself, write the adjectives on the bottom. Okay. Right. And then, um, on the top above, around her, put pictures of her engines. Okay. And put their personality traits with their pictures. Okay. On the bottom, put the pictures of her anchors and put their personality traits around them. Does that make okay. sense? This yeah. becomes your voice cheat sheet. Okay. Perfect. So you just have it open. It's got your character growth there in the middle. And the, it's a wheel, right? Like you can see the like circle of it. So it, you've got your character in the middle. You can see her positive growth and her negative growth to remind you kind of like, hey, here's where, here are the two versions of her that are battling against themselves. Across the top, we have her engines. Across the bottom, we have her anchors to remind us like these people pull her down or push her down. These people pull her up or push her up. Okay. Does that make sense? So, yeah. So since my, my story takes place um, part one, um, takes place with a whole different cast of characters. Do I do two of those wheels? I would. I'd probably do two wheels. I do one okay. for each part. I mean, it's whatever. This is a tool to like simplify things for you because you don't want to pull it. You don't want to pull up the spreadsheet every time you're going to oh, yeah. write a scene. 
you want mm-hmm. something that like you can put you can print off you can stick on a wall and you can just look at it and go got it yeah and then you roll. so yeah. i would recommend the less on there the better okay. right? like getting your cast together the less the better so mm-hmm. that you can just glance at it and be like okay i got it character okay. real let's go yeah. yeah okay so if you want to and you do have a clearly distinct like like a lot of people don't have that clear distinct part one and part two but you're like okay part one and part act one and part act two everybody changes out all new characters right like it's a little like it's like hamilton the musical when he's in you know the guy playing um uh uh hercules mulligan doesn't need to be hercules mulligan anymore because he disappears in the first half after the first half he's gone so he can come back and play james madison right like so you could do that like i'm just gonna flip the sheet and here's the new sheet Yeah. yeah yeah okay yeah yeah and it'll just be a cheat sheet for you to use as you like you know edit through your characters edit through your scenes it's like a especially since i I know you've written a lot and in that editing phase it's helpful to be to remind yourself like this is who this is supposed to be so when i go to edit a scene just another tip when i go to edit a scene i look at my sheet and i'm like this is who these people are supposed to be but then as i edit i ask myself are they being who i want them to be Okay. If they're not, you have to edit their voice. It means something's wrong in the way they're talking, the way okay. their body language is, right? Like, because the uh, you know the dialogue is verbal and nonverbal communication. So there's something wrong with the way their body language is. You might find that like, man, I have this scene, and you know, um, Maya, for there's something wrong. She's not working. You might just isolate the times that she has body language or speaks. And be like, is she bright and cheery in these moments? Mm-hmm. Or can I feel that she's modulated out of that? Like, she doesn't always have to be like, ha ha, like she's going to have sad moments. But do yeah. those sad moments feel like a loss of her? Right? Like, so if she's, if there's a moment where she's like, Effie, how could you do that? That was so stupid. That's not no voice. And you yeah. may not see it when you're writing it but when you're editing it that's what you got to be thinking about like does this character's utterances their verbal and nonverbal communication line up with mm-hmm. their voice okay yeah makes sense okay um anything else i can help with um no i think that ought to do it for today awesome all right i'm gonna stop the recording we can talk a little bit more okay if i can find the button there it is